Thank you for joining me for part two of What's the Big Deal About Baptism. This is part two of a four-part series. In our last lesson, we examined the Old Testament roots that form the basis of the foundation for New Testament baptism. In this lesson, we want to look at baptism as presented in the Gospels, as well as the emergence of baptism in the book of Acts. I mean, what did baptism in the New Testament look like? And why and how was it carried out? What is the significance of baptism? Is baptism something that we're commanded to do? And what should be our response to baptism today? Well, let me say at the outset here that I am the product of the Evangelical Mainstream Church. I don't say that disparagingly in any way. I'm thankful for those that God used in my life as I came to faith and grew in the faith. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior at the Billy Graham Crusade at the LA Coliseum in 1963. And thereafter, I was baptized as a believer in a Baptist church. At least my American Baptist church, they cared about baptism. Some churches today, they fall on the other end of the spectrum. For example, the Evangelical Free Church of America provides latitude on whether baptism should be required for church membership. Based on the denomination's autonomy, it's a local church matter. And some congregations believe the only requirement for church membership is simply being born again. And this stands in stark contrast with the New Testament and all of Christian history. For the apostles and faithful Christians after them, baptism was a necessary rite of passage for joining the church. During the Jesus Movement of the late 60s and 70s, I attended a church in Costa Mesa, California, where they had mass beach baptisms once a month, where anywhere from 300 to 1,000 were baptized. It was an amazing sight, and here's a video of one of those baptisms held in 1972 at Corona Del Mar, California. Many of those being baptized had come out of the hippie movement, espousing free love and sex and drugs. They were so thankful to be set free from all that by Yeshua. So as they were about to be baptized, they'd often say something like, hold me down a long time because I've got a lot to bury. One of the great things about those baptisms was they taught the new believers that they were burying their old man in the waters of baptism and that they were being raised to new life in Christ. Before we get into the teaching of baptism, I want to share one more story. Around spring of 1973, I was living in a Christian commune in Burlington, Vermont, and I was invited to teach a Bible study to about 100 Catholic Charismatics at St. Mark's Church in North Burlington, Vermont. Somewhere around the third week of the teaching, I brought up the subject of baptism and the fact that you need to be baptized after receiving Jesus. Well, all these Catholics who were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues, but they'd been baptized as infants in the Catholic Church, and they didn't appreciate me telling them that their infant baptism wasn't good enough. Their elders, they took offense at my teaching, and basically at that moment in time, they gave me the left foot of fellowship and said, thank you, Brother Dale, but we won't be needing any more teaching from you. Bye, and don't let the door hit you on the way out. Well, I had very little contact with any of these Catholics over the next year. But one day, about a year later, I received a call from one of the Catholic elders asking to speak with me in person. We met together, 
And he said that since our last meeting, about 12 months earlier, he and the other elders of their charismatic fellowship, they had been studying the word and praying and asking the Holy Spirit to lead and guide them into all truth. And they finally come to the realization that they needed to be baptized as new believers in Jesus. And they asked me if I and some other leaders from our commune would baptize them, and we agreed. And the following Sunday afternoon at Mallets Bay, Vermont, we baptized about a hundred of these Catholic Charismatics in Lake Champlain. The next day there was a front page story in the Burlington Free Press with a color photo of the baptism and an interview with the Catholic Bishop of Burlington, Vermont, who denounced what we had done, saying that we were proselytizing these Catholics and taking them away from the church. But the fact is that other than baptize them on that Sunday afternoon, we didn't talk to them about leaving the Catholic Church. All we did was baptize them into the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we sang a few songs of worship and praise. We had a brief time of prayer offering up thanksgiving and praise. And then we went our separate ways. At no time did we encourage them to leave the Catholic Church. Well, about a few months after that, a couple of Catholic families turned up at the Assembly of God Church where I was on staff. And slowly, one family at a time would turn up at either the Missionary Alliance Church and, or the Southern Baptist Church or the Assembly of God Church. And they never told any of the other families in their charismatic fellowship that they were leaving. They tried to be as discreet as possible and not influence the decision of any of the other families. Some were so surprised and shocked when they visited one of these evangelical churches to find some other families from the Catholic Fellowship already firmly planted in one of these three evangelical churches. But here's the amazing thing. About a year after these 100 Catholics were baptized into Jesus as new believers, they had all left the Catholic Church and no one had told them that they had to leave. They came to that decision independent of any other man. The one who told them that they had to leave was the Holy Spirit. God himself told them to leave. And here's an interesting thing. Experience can and will change your doctrine. There are those who don't believe God heals today. And then when they're healed, their belief in healing changes. There are those who don't believe in the existence of demonic spirits today. And when they see demons cast out of someone, their doctrine of demon possession changes. And the same is true for baptism. One example in Acts where experience changed doctrine is Acts 10 and 11. Peter has the vision with a sheet coming down with the four-footed creatures, beasts, and crawling creatures. God gives Peter this vision to declare that Gentiles are no longer unclean. And Peter, along with six men, visit Cornelius, and God has prepared his heart so that he and his household are baptized in the Holy Spirit, in much the same way as the Spirit fell upon Peter and everyone else on the day of Pentecost. And then Peter baptizes them. When James and the other brothers hear this, they glorify God, and they admit that God has now granted Gentiles repentance leading to eternal life. It was Peter's testimony of what he had experienced, along with the fact that the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius' household, just as he had fallen on James and all the brethren of the Jerusalem church. Therefore, they could no longer say that the gospel is only for Jews. Their doctrine changed because of what Peter had experienced, and he testified to them. That Paul himself at his conversion was baptized, and so had his sins washed away, that's the testimony of Acts 22.6 that he gives before the mob that wanted to kill him there in Jerusalem. When in his letters he reminds his Christian readers of the meaning of their baptism, he associates his own baptism with theirs. He says, All of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. In one spirit we are all baptized into one body. You see, Paul's understanding of baptism, it grew out of his own experience, where Ananias laid hands on him and baptized him in the name of the Lord Jesus. Water baptism is the first step of obedience in our lives, and God can't and he probably won't begin to show us much else until we take that first step of obedience to his command. Our baptism into Yeshua, it buries the old man, the old nature, and all the teachings of man, as well as our allegiance to men and the doctrines of men in just dead religion. The only way to get our mind and our heart cleansed from the lies and deception of religion and man's doctrine is to be baptized. I used to think that if someone was coming out of Scientology or Mormonism or being a Jehovah's Witness, that they most definitely need to be baptized to be cleansed and set free from all the false doctrine and lies. Well, yes, that's so true. But you see, we all need to be set free from the past, from man's teaching, from religion, from our old life, from wrong thinking, from sinful ways. I mean, that's just part of what takes place through the supernatural power of baptism into Yeshua. And now let's take a look at New Testament baptism. 
In our last lesson, we saw that the same ritual cleansing that was required of Aaron and his sons being cleansed for priesthood was part of the Old Testament ritual, which is the very root and foundation for baptism. Ceremonial purification by means of immersion or baptism was a very important part of Israelite life in tabernacle and temple times. People, hands, ritual implements, and clothing, they all had to undergo baptism. In the Old Testament as well as the New Testament period, baptism was common. One of the few cities in the world where 5,000 men could be baptized in one day was Jerusalem. Archaeology has revealed many mikvah, or ritual baptismal pools, all over Jerusalem, enough to baptize several thousand people in a single day. We said that John's baptism had two focal points. It inaugurated the new life of the converted, assuring the baptized of forgiveness and cleansing from sin, and it anticipated Messiah's baptism with spirit and fire. We saw that John's baptism in Acts 19, it was insufficient because even though those that John had baptized had their hearts prepared for the Messiah, they still need to hear the good news and be baptized into the Yeshua and receive the Holy Spirit. And finally, in looking at why Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, Jesus said that it was to fulfill all righteousness. And Jesus was 30 years old when he was baptized, which is the age when Levites began their temple ministry. And Jesus was baptized as our great high priest in order to fulfill all righteousness. But I also gave another reason as to what I believe Jesus meant when he said that he had to be baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. Along with his baptism and initiation as our great high priest, I also believe that Jesus went into the waters of baptism as our example, that we should follow his example. Time and again, Jesus called people to follow him in Matthew 10, 38. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So by being baptized, Yeshua knew that his disciples, those who had received him and were following him, that they would also follow him in baptism. Now let's look at the Great Commission, the mandate to make disciples. There's much talk today in the church about making disciples. Hundreds of books have been written on the subject. Courses taught on how to make a disciple. There are even staff positions in churches with the title Pastor of Discipleship. But where do we get our mandate to make disciples? Most would say that it comes from Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where the 11 disciples go to a mountain in Galilee. Here they meet up with Jesus. At the sight of him, they worship him. Here are Jesus' final words to his disciples as recorded by Matthew. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, after informing his disciples that all authority has been given to him, both in heaven and on earth, which is no small thing, it sets the stage for what's to follow. Because Jesus tells them, or he commands them, to go and make disciples of all nations. Now this has been the entire basis of our missionary thrust since this command was given. I mean, we send missionaries all over the world because Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples of all the nations. This is also why we endeavor to make disciples. Even if we're not really making disciples, we know that this is part of our calling and our job description as followers of Yeshua. After all, how did we become believers? Didn't someone tell us? Many of us could point to different individuals whom the Spirit of God used to shape our lives as disciples. We could say much more about the matter of making disciples, but we're going to leave it at that for now. And then Yeshua instructs and commands his 11 disciples on what they need to do in order to make disciples. He says, Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then they are to teach these disciples to observe all that Yeshua has commanded. And then he closes by assuring them that no matter what they encounter in terms of opposition or trials, that he'll be with them always, even to the very end of the age. In other words, he's not going to hang them out to dry, but he'll be with them. And we see through the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ, descends upon the church and empowers the followers of Yeshua. Our Lord is commanding the disciples to go forth and make disciples. He says, go and find someone that you can instruct in the way and baptize them and teach them all that I've commanded you. This is what discipleship is all about. The fact is that you and I obey this command. We go forth. We find someone to baptize, to teach and make into a disciple of Yeshua. And guess what? We're being discipled at the very same time. We don't become disciples of Yeshua in some sterile classroom environment or by sitting down and reading a book on discipleship or by attending a weekend seminar on discipleship. Now, God can use that to inspire us and get us moving out of our comfort zones. 
but we're really being shaped and formed as Yeshua's disciples when we go and we find someone who needs to hear the good news, we begin to teach them all that Christ commanded, and then we baptize them in his name. Because in the process, we are becoming more like Jesus at the same time that we're making disciples. And then we teach them that they need to go and make disciples as well, so that they too will become more of a disciple of Jesus and become more like him. Well, here in the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples that they need to teach or disciple before they even baptize. Yeshua actually says that they need to teach twice here in this passage. They teach or make disciples, which is the initial contact with a person, and you begin the discipleship process. It occurs long before they place their faith and trust in Yeshua. You begin to raise the flag and engage them in conversation. And you answer their questions, and you pray for them. And you pray for them a lot. You pray against strongholds in their hearts and minds. You pray for God to give them open ears and receptive hearts. You may be praying for them to be healed or set free. And the answer to this prayer could be the very thing that opens them up to hearing the good news of the kingdom. But you see, all of this is a process. When they come to the point of repentance and confessing their sins and acknowledging their need for Yeshua as their Savior, they receive Him and they place their faith and trust in Him. It's at this point that our Lord is saying the next step is to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here's how Peter put it on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to their heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children, and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Well, the hearts of those who heard Peter, their hearts were pierced. In other words, they were under conviction. They were under godly sorrow, which the scripture says leads to repentance. And then Peter tells them to repent and for each of them to be baptized. You see, repentance must come before baptism. Now, Peter certainly thought that baptism was crucial. I mean, he didn't think that preaching and proclamation was enough by itself. The order in which he expresses things is very important. Peter didn't say, repent every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then you'll be baptized as a purely symbolic act of thankfulness. So the first condition that must be met before one is baptized is repentance, turning from our sins. The second condition that needs to be met before one is baptized is found in Acts 8 in the encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip encountered the eunuch on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. He heard him reading from Isaiah, and the Holy Spirit prompted Philip to go up to him and ask him if he understood what he was reading. And the eunuch said, no, how can I unless someone explains it to me? Now here's discipleship taking place at this very moment. The minute that Philip responded to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and he ran up to the Ethiopian eunuch's chariot, and he asked the question, Do you understand what you're reading? Philip was making a disciple out of this royal official who was headed back to Ethiopia. And here's what happened next in Acts 8.30. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to a slaughter. As a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself, or is he speaking of someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but he went on his way rejoicing. Well, out there in the desert, they came upon some water, and the eunuch exclaims, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? This Ethiopian eunuch knew that he needed to be baptized. I don't know if Phil told him or if he just knew that baptism is what happens when you receive Jesus into your life. Another thing I've often thought is that they're out in the desert. It just so happens that they come upon some water. 
My thought is that God put that water there at that moment so the Ethiopian eunuch could be baptized and take the good news along with the need to be baptized back to Ethiopia and North Africa. In other words, he would say to everyone, if you want to follow Jesus, here's what you need to do. And the second condition after repentance is that you believe and confess a faith in Yeshua as Lord and Savior. The third condition for Christian baptism is stated by the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 3.20 who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here, Peter's comparing Christian baptism in water to the experience of Noah and his family who were saved from the wrath and judgment of God as they entered by faith into the ark. And then once they were inside the ark, they passed safely through the waters of the flood. In direct reference to this experience of Noah and his family, here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.20. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, here Peter dismisses any crude suggestions that the purpose of baptism is any kind of cleansing or bathing of the physical body. Rather, he says the essential condition of Christian baptism lies in the inner response of the believer's heart, the answer of a good conscience toward God. The inner response of a good conscience towards God, Peter indicates, is made possible through faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here are the three conditions that must be met for Christian baptism. First, repentance, turning from our sins. Second, believe and confess your faith in Yeshua as Lord and Savior. And third, a good conscience toward God made possible by putting one's faith in the resurrection of Yeshua. As we examine these three conditions, we can't help but notice that they automatically rule out one class of persons, and that is infants. Babies can't be taught. They can't repent. They can't believe or confess, and they can't answer with a good conscience toward God. Therefore, they really are ineligible for Christian baptism. And with these three conditions that are necessary before one can be baptized, it's important that we not fall prey to the overemphasis on teaching. In the church where I was baptized, I had to go through a 10-week course before I could be baptized. However, we see Peter showing up at Cornelius' home. And after hearing Cornelius' testimony and seeing them baptized in the Holy Spirit, Peter and the six brothers, they baptized them that very same hour. They didn't mess around. They didn't waste any time at all. And now let's look at the emergence of baptism in the book of Acts. A church which prohibited the reading and proclamation of the Word of God, it would cease to be a church. And where in the scale of necessity does baptism stand? At an early point in the progress of the Christian mission, a group of Jewish Christians asserted that Gentile believers, unless you become circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. The issue was fiercely debated, and although according to Acts, the assertion was denied by the assembled church in Jerusalem, it's clear from Paul's letters that some Jerusalem Christian teachers they never accepted the majority decision, for they continued to infiltrate the Gentile churches with their teaching. Would a debate have arisen if one had asserted, unless you become baptized, according to the custom of the church, you cannot be saved? Well, the answer is not immediately apparent. Baptism, however, meant a committal to obedience to Christ. The assertion, unless you become baptized, you cannot be saved, it would have sounded to a first-generation Christian like saying, unless you believe in our Christ, you cannot be a Christian. And no controversy could have arisen on that basis. It's only because in the development of the church, the whole complex of baptism to faith, to confession, to spirit, to church, to life, to sanctification has been torn asunder that the question has been forced upon us between the relationship between baptism as an act and that which it represents and whether the reality can be gained apart from the act with which it's associated in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul had been baptized, and he makes repeated allusions to baptism in his letters, assuming that all other Christians had been baptized. Paul's language in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, as well as Colossians 2, 12, imply that baptism is an initiation to life in Christ as well as the church. It would seem reasonable then to conclude, therefore, that everyone in the apostolic church who believed was baptized, and no one who was baptized had not believed. As F.F. F. Bruce has noted, the idea of an unbaptized Christian is simply not entertained in the New Testament. Baptism in Acts is always administered in the name of Jesus Christ, or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 2.38 And then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, 
and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 8, 16, For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In Acts 10, 48, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So why does the mainstream church persist in using the Trinitarian formula for baptism? They're just repeating a command that our Lord gave in Matthew 20 and 19, but they're not really doing what he said. What is that name that constitutes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I believe our disciples knew that our Lord was commanding them to baptize in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ. You would think that all the great minds of the church, both past and present, would look at how baptism was administered in the book of Acts by the very ones who were there when Jesus gave his command, the Great Commission. I mean, they were there. They heard him. So how did they carry it out? How did they live out and practice this command to baptize? You see, there's no scriptural support for baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, nothing in the book of Acts was done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why is that? When you understand who you're being baptized into, it makes all the sense in the world that you baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul describes what takes place at baptism in Romans 6, verse 3. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. The point I want to make here is that when you read everything that Paul writes concerning baptism, it centers on Yeshua and baptism into his death and being raised with him to a newness of life. You take on his identity. That's why baptism is not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're not buried with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're not taking on the identity of the Father and the Holy Spirit. You're taking on Christ's identity. Let me give you another example in Acts 19. Paul is entering Ephesus where he encounters some disciples of John the Baptist. And here's his conversation with them in Acts 19. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. And then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who comes after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Here Paul asks the disciples of John a very strange question. Into what then were you baptized? You see, according to their answer, Paul would know whether or not they were born again. But why ask them, into what then were you baptized? Do you see the answer Paul is looking for? It is baptized into the Lord Jesus. If you say baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eh, wrong answer. Nobody would say that in the first century church. When Paul asked them, into what then were you baptized? He's mindful of what he's written in Romans chapter 6, that our baptism is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, into his death, burial, and resurrection. In Acts 22, Paul had been seized by a mob and dragged out of the temple. He's then given an opportunity to give his testimony. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law, and was spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, he came to me and he's standing near and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very time, I looked up at him. Now notice that Paul said that Ananias was devout by the standard of the law. He was obedient to the law of Moses. And Yeshua called Ananias to go and pray for Saul. In Acts 22, 14, And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will, and to see the righteous one, and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you'll be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. You see, no subsequent rite of the church, even confirmation, adequately replaces baptism. Something else that we learn from Paul's testimony of Ananias, which he fills in with more details in Acts 9.17. Ananias laid hands on Paul to be healed and regain his sight, as well as to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see the laying on of hands, which are included in the book of Hebrews, which could very well have been written by the Apostle Paul. Hebrews includes the laying on of hands along with the instruction about baptisms. Then let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying in the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying out of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting will do so. Baptism and the laying out of hands were part of the elementary teachings about Christ. They were the initial building blocks in the faith of a new believer. 
laying out of hands was employed in the Old Testament when they are offering a sacrifice in Leviticus 1.3, in the consecration of Levites in the service of the temple in Numbers 8.10, in the impartation of a blessing in Genesis 48.14, Moses laying hands on Joshua, which resulted in Joshua becoming a second Moses in Numbers 27.18, and in the New Testament, the laying out of hands occurs when praying for healing as well as being baptized in the Spirit. Yeshua laying hands on the sick and healing them in Luke 4.10. Peter and John laying hands on the Samaritans to receive the Holy Spirit in Acts 8.17. Ananias laying hands on Saul to be healed and filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 9.17. And Paul laying hands on Plubius' father to be healed in Acts 28.8. Obviously, the laying out of hands is a continuation of the impartation of a blessing if one considers healing and being filled with the Holy Spirit as blessings from the Lord. G.R. Beasley Murray writes, Again and again we have cause to remind ourselves that Christian baptism is baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. In it, the name of the Lord is called over the baptized, declaring him to be the Lord's. And the name of the Lord is confessed and invoked by the one being baptized. It's this confessed relationship with the crucified, risen Redeemer that constitutes for a Christian baptism and decisive for its significance. Well, in part three, we're going to look at Paul's writings on baptism in his epistles. We're going to discover what Paul knew about baptism that was so powerful and has essentially been emasculated or neutered in today's modern church. What Paul and the first century Christians knew about baptism and its transforming power, it's been lost in our modern day church. We'll look at Paul's extensive writings on baptism in Romans 6. We'll examine the relationship between baptism and our identity in Christ. Along with that, we're going to answer the question, is there such a thing as a New Testament circumcision? Well, we need to test everything, even some of our most cherished doctrines. If we're faithful to the Word as we test everything, then we have nothing to fear. But if we're holding on to cherished beliefs that have no biblical basis in truth, then we most certainly would want to receive correction. As Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Well, I hope this teaching was a blessing to you that's given you much to think about and consider. Please watch the next video where we continue the teaching on baptism in lesson three. Until next time, remember, as John always says, to test everything. Shalom.